3D Systems is one of the largest players in 3D printing and additive manufacturing, but like a lot of other players in the industry, they've seen their share of lumpy quarters as the enterprise buying cycle fluctuates. Vyomish Joshi uh, joined 3D Systems as CEO after leading HP's printing business for years, Joshi, or VJ, has restructured 3D Systems business to better focus on industries such as healthcare while rolling out what it hopes will be disruptive products. VJ has a big job aside from revamping 3D Systems. He has had to compete with the likes of Stratasys as well as HP, his previous employer. We're going to talk a little bit about the future of additive manufacturing with VJ, as well as ZDNet's Larry Dignan and Tech Republic's Jason Heiner. I'm Dan Patterson. VJ, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I, I wonder if we could uh, maybe start with a little bit, a nutshell of your background at HP and 3D Systems. Yeah, I uh, joined Hewlett Packard in 1980, started as an R&D engineer, and then I um, I started working on um, printing technology. Uh, and from 2001 to 2012, you know, I ran uh, HP's printing business. You know, I took the printing business from 19 billion revenue to close to $28 billion and uh, improved the profitability from 10% to 16%. And that experience was very uh, important for me when I started working at 3D Systems. Um, the first thing I did was try to understand the technology because my view uh, for any new innovative um, category, it has to start with the technology. And Chuck Hull, who is a 3D Systems um, CTO, showed me the technology that they have at 3D Systems. I felt that now with this technology, I can take the whole industry from focusing on prototyping to production. And that really got me excited. So you've recently you've recently restructured a bit to focus more on industry specific things like automotive, healthcare, that kind of thing. Um, is that the approach we're going to see going forward from the industry overall? Because I noticed Stratasys is doing something similar. Um, I guess walk me through the vertical specific approach. Yeah, I think you know for me it's not about technology. It starts with the customer, and um, when I look at the four key segments, the vertical segments that I'm really interested in. Healthcare is the first example. So if you think about healthcare, uh, by 2020, you know, this is Gartner says, that 10% to 20% of all the stuff that they are going to either uh, wear them on them or inside their body will be 3D printed uh, medical device. And I think that's, that's a big deal. Uh, another statistic I can give you, you know, just on a dentistry, right? There are 7 billion people and 32 teeth. That means 210 billion custom parts, you know, that could be the business opportunity. So healthcare, to me, looked very interesting opportunity. And the workflow point of view, all the way from uh, digitization to design to simulation to manufacture the part, if you can understand our workflow and then provide the complete solution, to that workflow, you know, you will have a unique competitive advantage. And healthcare is our biggest business. And I thought that the same approach that what I did with healthcare, I can take that for aerospace, automotive, and consumer durable goods, you know, we will have the right strategy. Are those industries mostly um, custom work? So there are two parts, you know, so I think for healthcare, it's the custom uh, because, you know, so if you, th I'm just giving an example. This is a, um, um, you know, it, right now, most of the um, way this thing dentures are done is manual process. Now, if you can automate that and you digitize your, um, you know, mouth, and then you can have a custom piece, it will be a very powerful for the customers because it will fit first time rather than trying it out three, four times. And that process takes, three months, very painful process plus expensive. So doing this thing digitally and custom, I think that's where the value proposition is. Now in aerospace, uh, the uh, opportunity is not about custom. The opportunity is about um, complex. Because if you think about, if I want to try to create a um, part for the uh, aerospace engine, 
you know, can I do a design with which I can take the overall weight down by 30% because it can have significant fuel saving. And then complexity is free in 3D printing. That's the approach you want to take on aerospace. So for complex and custom parts, 3D printing is where, you know, you will have a big opportunity to do innovation. How much of your business today, um, you know, like what percentage of the business today is, is, is still prototyping versus, you know, the, this, the new stuff, the additive manufacturing. Um, and, and then like, where do you want that to be? Where do you see that in three years, two, three years from now? So for healthcare, you know, this is like $125 million business out of our 650. It's more about um, production workflows. But the remaining part of our business in the other segments, I would say that 90% is prototyping right now. And then shifting to production, you know, requires a very different approach in terms of the materials development. For prototyping, it's all about form and fit. When you want to think about production, it also is functionality. That means the part that you are creating need to have functionality so that they could be end user part. You know, they can't be breaking if I'm doing the way I'm really pushing the part or if I'm making a flexible part, you know, it can be. So this has to be used by the end user customer in the production environment. So the user needs point of view, you need productivity, you need the part which could be um, having durability and repeatability and the cost of operation. Because what you want to do is your traditional process, let's say, for example, in a plastic part, it's about molding. So if you have a molded part, you know, there would be a certain cost structure. You need to be reasonable with respect to the additive manufacturing part, which is meeting all the functionality need and all the right total cost of operation. Once you achieve that, then, you know, there is a real need to move to production because, you know, what you are designing the processes um, the current uh, approach, now you don't need to have mold uh, kind of a cycle time. That means you could compress your overall product life cycle significantly. And I think that's where the promise of 3D printing long term for complex and um, custom parts will be. So are, where are we at in that process? Is it, if this were like a baseball game, is it still like the first inning, second inning in terms of additive manufacturing really um, revolutionizing manufacturing process? So I would say it's we are in the first inning because, you know, from the production point of view, from prototyping point of view, I think we probably are in seventh or eighth inning, you know, but yeah. from production point of view, and the reason for that is materials. Because, you know, um, my view is materials is where the innovation has to happen. And um, as for example, on the healthcare side, you know, I really wanted to make sure we get the right kind of a materials company which can create the teeth and all this, you know, uh, indication. So we acquired a company next dent from uh, Holland and they have been doing dental materials for the last 40 years, but they invented down materials, those dental materials for additive manufacturing. And now with our technology of, you know, the way we do our printers and materials, we can go after the dental industry. So the starting point is materials. And I'm putting tremendous R&D resources to really figure out the right kind of materials. The innovation that we are doing now, the, the um, figure four is a technology that I want to talk about. So with this technology, uh, we will be able to print fast. That's the second requirement for production because you know it can't take 20 hours to create a part. It has to be done in minutes. So now with figure four, uh, imaging technology and the materials, we will be able to produce parts like million parts a year, you know, using the additive manufacturing. So the first thing is materials. Second thing is high speed production equipment. And third thing, of course, is the workflow. So on the materials, just so, I mean, the economic model we're all very familiar with, with traditional printing and you especially. Yes. Um, you sell printer for not much and you make a lot of bank on the ink. Mm -hmm. How does materials fit into the economic equation for you and also for the tech buyer? Because yeah, so I can see the argument where 
like in traditional printing, I don't necessarily have to go out and buy ink. Right. It's kind of like a, it's a consumable, like could purchase or not. But if you're a manufacturer, right. you got to buy these raw materials anyway. Right. So, so I guess what's the economic picture? Yeah, I think, I, think, I think it's a very similar business model. Okay. Because, um, you know, we will be um, installing the uh, printers and then they will be using materials to create the part. So the material pricing, you know, it has to be such that um, they will be able to see the advantage of collapsing that overall product life cycle. So, so let's say, a, um, let's talk about uh, crowns and bridges for dental uh, business. So if you go and uh, to a dentist right now and say, you know, I want to get a crown for my, um, you know, mouth, they will charge you thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. You know, and the way their crowns are done is using a milling machine where uh, you start with a $50 um, part and then you mill the crown from that. And the lab will charge the dentist $150. But because it's a subtractive, that means you are really milling the crown, the, the cost of that is much higher. But if you are only printing, you may need only two to three gram of material. And that crown probably will cost, it's not $150 to the um, dentist from the lab, but maybe half or even less than that. Now you have a very uh, powerful way to not only meet the custom digitized um, dentistry needs, but also with the right kind of a cost structure. And that material, because we are using fewer grams compared to the subtractive process, I can also charge uh, at a reasonable level where we can be making enough gross margin. So I just give you an example where compared to the traditional process, actually the cost will come down and will create a much better custom part. In the aerospace, or let's talk about the industrial version of that, a complex part can't be created with a traditional uh, manufacturing. So there is some kind of a expectation that that part will be a little bit more expensive than the traditional manufacturing. So that expectation of having the higher price that I can also make margin on the material. So my view is that we need to make sure that we make a contribution in the way a complex or custom part is done and there will be enough margin in the materials. Okay. Does, do the materials have to come from you or do you see an ecosystem building where, you know, somebody like BASF or whoever? So, in, yeah, initially, initially the materials, you know, because there is a big um, work that we have to do in terms of the chemistry of the material, the hardware and the software. So that three combination of that is very important. Plus, we are printing now at a much higher speed. I talked about production. Production speeds are much higher. So I think the way I think about this thing is initially we will be offering a materials from 3D systems. We will partner with some other materials manufacturers so they could also have a second source, but that will be the initial part. I don't think open materials, you know, the way people talk about is going to happen right away because you need to have the right kind of a chemistry, you know, and that chemistry is where the innovation is. The example I can give you when I was doing the um, work in the graphics printing industry, where we were replacing the Heidelberg press with our uh, web press when I was at HP, we had a similar thing, you know, most of the Heidelberg press were using inks, which were available for hundreds of years, you know, the printing inks. But when we started working on the web press, that ink had to be designed specifically for digital printing. And the ink business model was very similar to the um, home and the um, SMB uh, business model. So I think initially, I truly believe because of the innovation that we are doing in creating that part at a high speed, the materials will be developed by 3D systems with a partner. So even if the, the materials cost the same or you know are, are, are roughly equal, do you see businesses, you know, in terms of the demand you're getting from the, from the businesses that are, that are using this, um, the ability to, to be so much more agile uh, and so much faster, uh, change faster, do smaller runs, those kinds of things. 
is that benefit um, enough? And is that what's driving a lot of the demand um, that, that the cost isn't as important? I, I guess I'm asking, how important is the cost versus okay. the ability to, to be faster and more agile? Yeah, so I think, I, think, I think if you think about a CEO of a company, of aerospace, automotive, consumer durable goods, they all are interested in innovation and compressing the development cycle, right? Going from concept, the idea, into then designing it, running the pilot, run volumes, and then actually production. So that takes right now two to three years. They would like to compress that cycle to one year. And that's where the most of the innovation that what we are talking about is compressing that product life cycle. And people will pay premium in achieving that and the cost will not be you know, as important. But I'm thinking long-term, I'm thinking long-term, you know, that innovation, so let's say that we invented a completely new way of doing dentures. So initially people will be fine, but two to three years from today, they will say, no, 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 no. You need to now, take the cost out. And I, I'm just looking at a long-term point of sure. view. The value proposition of compressing the product life cycle is the right thing first, but eventually you need to pay attention to the total cost of operation. As a matter of fact, we started working with one of the um, Fortune 50 companies, you know, using the additive manufacturing to create a real production line. And the starting point was, wow, I couldn't do this thing with any other way of a traditional way of creating the complex part. But then we started talking to the manufacturing manager and saying, okay, now you're going to put this into your manufacturing environment. They basically started saying, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I can do this with a traditional process with a much lower yield. But for me to really justify that, I need to look at the total cost of operations. So I think my view is the R&D department will be fine. But when you go and talk to the manufacturing manager, they are going to focus on the cost of operations. That makes sense. So where do you think we'll be with additive manufacturing in the next two to three years? So I think if you look at the maturity curve, you know, so if, if I look at all the enterprises in globally, only 4% are really understanding the value of additive manufacturing. That means 96% of the enterprises are still playing with it. They see the value, but they don't have the experience. So my view, first thing is, more and more companies are seeing the value and then they need to build a skill set within the company and working with us in driving more and more design, a complex or custom design, you know, to additive manufacturing. I think that's going to take some time. So that's the first thing, getting the engagement in a different kind of a way with the companies like 3D Systems in figuring out how they can change and compress their product life cycle and then get complex and custom designs to additive manufacturing. The second thing is materials. I, I really believe it's all about materials. Just like in my um, other printing, you know, it was all about ink. Here it is all about materials because there is so much innovation required so that we can create those parts which are durable and at a higher speed. So the second innovation I really believe is in the materials. The third thing is, I think that all these uh, production equipment needs to have a lot more automation. It's not just about printing, the whole post-processing, integrating them into the factory systems is going to be the third one. So I do believe in next three years, you're going to see more materials, higher speed, so that more and more production will go with the additive manufacturing. and integrating them into the factory systems. Those are the three key trends that you could expect. How about uh, if you go down the road and the, the, this has the impact, you know, that you're envisioning um, with additive manufacturing and it does revolutionize uh, manufacturing and, and is built into production. Um, how will that affect the, the, the labor market, right? Because yeah, um, yeah. certainly that's going to change a lot of processes at a lot of companies. And, and how about, especially as you think about geographies and, uh, and, and those kinds of things, how, how do you see the impact? So I think, I think, I think that there are two or three things that I want to talk about there. The first thing is, I think this, this will enable going from mass production to mass customization. So I think that will be 
you know the first thing that i would think about because you know that means that you will be able to customize the product at the point of delivery so you need to think about you know what that will bring the second thing is i honestly believe that um, once you start thinking about a uh, innovation and the manufacturing innovation which is design oriented the production that right now goes to the other countries you know we are outsourcing to china or um, other countries probably you could pull it back you know make in the united states you know that's the something that you want to do you will build the factories now which can make mass customization in your location rather than trying because you know you are really creating the value of mass customization is something that you want to think about that means the supply chain point of view you know there will be more innovation now where you don't have to rely on sending all your parts to uh, you know china because what you are doing is yeah you may be paying a little bit more but because you are compressing the overall product life cycle the innovation cycle you know will be able to uh, do more products faster at a reasonable cost so i might also believe the supply chain impact is going to be also very big uh, with respect to this technology and a third thing is because um, you know especially in healthcare you know where um, you want to have uh, custom implants you know the things that um, can change the outcomes for the patients is going to be also very important so this technology not only it will bring a completely new way of doing things with respect to um, you know mass customization and collapsing the product life cycle in healthcare it will help to have much better patient outcomes what's the what's the role of the service bureau in all this and you know what can what can that model disrupt in terms of retail and supply chain and things like that so i think service bureau you know when when we did um, a lot of research uh, and there is also published research 40% of enterprises are not interested in bringing this technology in house they want to rely on a service bureau where they can actually make the products for them so think about the right now contract manufacturers right the contract manufacturer model is basically saying we will do manufacturing for you the enterprise so i think similar model will happen in additive manufacturing when a service bureau will say you know we will be able to serve your needs you know in terms of manufacturing or your peaks you know with a service bureau so i i really believe there is a really big play for service bureaus to help to this transition to the additive manufacturing and being a capacity uh, for uh, what they want to outsource i i also believe that uh, service bureau will become the first place where we can actually test the additive manufacturing technology because they are already in production so if we help them you know they will become our initial customers where they will be testing our additive manufacturing technology so will that be, will the um service bureaus essentially become almost like three additive as a service like yes they almost be like a cloud model to handle capacity and things like that yeah i think i think think about the following right so if i am um uh enterprise and uh, i'm going to say you know i want to get into additive manufacturing i don't have a skill set i don't have the capability right now you know maybe i will work with 3d systems and say okay and i'll give you a very specific example in healthcare here <clears throat> you know that um, i want to create this medical device and um, can you help me to design that and then can you make 10 or 100 of those medical devices in an fda approved kind of an environment now i got the confidence i have the skill set now as a medical device manufacturer and then i say okay you proven to me now i'm going to pull that inside my factory so that i can be the provider of medical devices but i'm not sure that i want to take that risk why don't you make 50% of my capacity in your service bureau and then i will figure out you know how what i want to do in house versus what i want to do 
uh, you know, with a service bureau. So I, I really think this whole cycle, you know, holding their hands to cross that chasm of, um, you know, the additive manufacturing service bureau will play a very important role. Will it, so it's, it's, we've heard a lot about the, the scenario where Jason, your audio is very, very low there. Uh, heard a lot about service bureaus uh, impacting parts manufacturing or parts replacement. Uh, so, um, you know, if you, if you have a bad part in your lawnmower, for example, and being able to, you know, print it at the Home Depot and, and that kind of thing, is, is that scenario still legitimate? Do you see, are, are you seeing that happen yet? Um, are you guys partnering um, with, with companies? Uh, do, you, do you want to take I think, that opportunity? I think, I think that's going to take some time. Because my view is, uh, you know, those vision about Home Depot, you know, providing um, a, a spare part, I, I think it's going to take some time. It has to start with the big corporations first before it will go to the consumer. But I, I really don't think that, um, you know, because the economic model is not really working right now in making that happen. I would, because I think what we are talking about is um, aftermarket. Uh, kind of a production uh, support with the additive manufacturing. I think this will start with uh, aerospace companies, you know, because now you don't have to keep the inventory of your old planes and you will be able to print what you need. Um, so I think it's going to start with the big companies to really manage their aftermarket uh, supply chain. And then slowly it will come down to the consumer level. But I, I don't think that in the next five years I would be able to see Home Depot, you know, doing that. When, when is the enterprises adopting the, the large modular systems? Like right now it's all kind of prototyped out there, but, you know, it, it all kind of rhymes with like a data center if you kind of look at the architecture right. and how it's all fitting together. Right. What, what industries do you see deploying that kind of layout or, yeah. or that kind of system, what, you know, what industry should we look at to say they're so going to put this first? And the first thing will be service bureau, because as I said, they already have a production environment. So what service bureau is going to do is say, okay, let me start by technology with a certain kind of a capacity. And then I say, okay, I can now make a hundred thousand parts. Now the enterprise customer is saying, can you make 200,000? I will add another capacity, just like this, you know, the uh, way, a data center, you know, you could add more server box or a storage box to increase the capacity. And that's the kind of a platform approach that I have taken, you know, with the figure four technology. I think that once the service bureau proves that, hey, this thing is real, they will put that capacity into the enterprise, you know, and certain other enterprises who are at a maturity level three or four, they may say, hey, we are ready let's make uh, the investment to make 200,000 parts right now. My, I can see the volume going up and then I will add more capacity. So my, my view is service bureau will be the first one. High uh, maturity level of the enterprises, they understand the value of energy manufacturing will be the second one, especially in aerospace and in healthcare. I'm very bullish on dental uh, industry where I do believe that this transformation will happen especially in dentistry, faster because, you know, they already have digital input. You know, the scanners, like from Tree Shape, are really penetrating much bigger way into the dental lab. So the dental lab will be the second place where I see after Service Bureau, the adoption of this technology in a modular way that I'm talking about. Then aerospace will be the third one. And then at the appropriate time, the aftermarket that I talk about for automotive and aerospace will be the fourth one. How about skills gap? Is there a skills gap that you need to fill in order to, to, to achieve a lot of this that you're looking for? 3D modelers, um, whatever it may be. What, what kind of stuff? What kind of well, skills? I think, yeah. yeah, I think we are seeing skill gap. You know, so as for example, I gave you the example of the medical device manufacturer. You know, they are aspiration. They understand you know, that the 10% of all the medical devices will go to the additive manufacturing, but they don't have the skills. So what they are doing, they are relying on us to say, hey, provide the workflow know-how, provide the initial manufacturing capacity so that we can learn, 
And in 18 months from now, we will be able to make that happen. But that's a real thing. And that's why that crossing the chasm approach that I talked about, using our service bureau capability, using our workflow know-how is the way we are going to bring, you know, a use case and customer by customer and crossing that chasm. That's why having a solution vertical capability that I talked about is very, very important. So you need designers, you need like 3D modelers. What, who, what are the kind of skills that you need? So, you know, that you yeah, so, so if you look at the workflow, the first piece is the designers. Designers who understand how to do, how to create additive manufacturable, you know, part. That is how to create more shapes, more ways. And how do you, I understand that I have more freedom compared to using a traditional uh, manufacturing process. So it starts with a designer. That skill set is extremely important. And you know, all the big um, companies like Autodesk, Dussault Systems, they understand now that they need to create the software with which 3D printing is integral part of their software. So that's the innovation that software companies will have to do and designers will have to get trained on that piece of software. The second thing that they will have to understand is, okay, I got the designers. Do I have application engineering? Because, you know, it's all about materials, the hardware and the software. So the second very important skill gap that I believe is in application engineering. We will provide that support, but they also need to have in-house understanding of application engineering. That means if I want to create this part, you know, what kind of a, understanding I need to have from materials, hardware, and software. And the third thing that they will have to understand is I need to put this equipment into my manufacturing environment. You know, how do I integrate that so that I will be able to now use this technology in creating the part that I am designing for. So that's the whole manufacturing technology understanding and the skill set. So those three skill sets are going to be very important. And that's why having this model where we can hold their hands to cross the chasm is going to be important. And I think 3D Systems is uniquely positioned you know, to do that. There are a lot of competitors, you know, they are only doing printers and they say, you figure out your workflow. There are a lot of companies you know, who are only creating the workflow, but they are not into the hardware and materials. I think we are uniquely positioned to really help this transition from prototyping to production. So it's like business process re-engineering or supply chain architecting. That's the kind of stuff that you're putting your, that's where you're putting the eggs, you're putting your basket in is, is you guys doing all of that kind of stuff? So yeah, because I think fundamentally, any kind of a transformation requires a focus in terms of use case and then developing a technology and ability you know, to really drive that implementation. So the way I think about that, there is a consulting phase, initial phase where you work with the designers and figuring out that design. And there is an implementation phase where we work with both R&D and manufacturing team to actually create additive manufacturing factories. And then there is a support phase that once they have, you know, that equipment, we want to make sure that it runs smoothly and that it is uptime based. So you need to go from consulting to implementation to uh, actually support kind of a structure. And you need that infrastructure. You know, I think my view is because we are in this business for 30 years, we understand that you need to have use case and customer segmentation approach in making this kind of a transition from prototyping to production. What's, what's the role of the Fab Pro 1000? So Fab Pro 1000 are two key roles. The first is it's a price point where now you are able to achieve functional prototyping. That means you could create the parts which will have that functionality that I'm talking about. The $5,000 price point becomes very attractive, especially for emerging geographies and R&D departments. So now R&D department can buy Fab Pro and start experimenting with the design. And once they think that, hey, I can really create this design with this material, I may buy now figure four where I can get the right kind of a productivity and then a modular approach so that I can grow with the kind of a capacity. So the R&D engineering department, emerging geographies, 
will buy fab pro and once they are feeling good about the materials that they have they will work with the manufacturing department and they will buy figure 4 modular or the production systems okay so it's kind of seeding the market basically exactly the way i believe fundamentally that the final the technology has arrived where we can move from prototyping to low to medium volume production materials are going to be the key and the whole approach about uh, understanding the workflow know how materials hardware and software is what is going to really change you know this industry Dilmesh I actually have a uh, a uh, one last question regarding uh security and particularly with the integrity of the intellectual property of the designs where do you figure cybersecurity and the need to protect uh what you're working on where does that come into your process I think there are two parts the design process because you know that's where all the intellectual property is how you create that design you know we need to make sure that um, those things are protected and the second thing is if you outsource you know to a service bureau i think we need to make sure that um, those designs are protected and you know so that part of the process and the last part would be once you put this into the factory environment in any digital machine you know you need to make sure that we also protect the design all the way from the manufacturing point of view so those are the three locations where um, you know you need to pay attention to the cyber security Dilmesh Joshi VJ is the chief executive of 3D Systems. Larry Dignan of ZDNet and Jason Heiner of Tech Republic. You can read all about 3D printing and 3D systems by visiting ZDNet. For uh, Larry Dignan and Jason Heiner in New York, I'm Dan Patterson. <laughs>